Good evening again. You know, I never even knew this had lights on the side. <laughs> Must have had it for a couple of years. I never even noticed. How weird is that? Evidently, I'm always thinking on a higher plane. I think that must be what it is. Anyway, you're very welcome this evening. Here we are again. Part two of Ierica Synth's VCO build. Very exciting. Uh, I'll go through part one in, in just a moment, just once I've uh, settled myself. But um, the idea of this is to, is to live stream the real life um, building of... Uh, these extraordinary educational DIY kits, America Since, and uh, and Mr. Moritz Klein, and I have found this to be extremely challenging and interesting, and I have learnt a huge amount. And I don't mean challenging as in impossible or too much, but you know, on the edge of that, it's really pushed me. It's pushed me to to think really hard and to and to, I don't know, grasp concepts which I knew were there and have some familiarity with, but I've not really hammered home to myself. So this has really been a fantastic opportunity to learn about circuits, to learn about design, to learn about the basic building blocks which put together synthesizers and oscillators and VCAs. And this is going to grow over time as we do more of these modules, because there's a whole load of them. <laughs> so we're going to get to that, I think. <clears throat> so good to see you here. Uh, it's, it's nice that everybody else is drinking. I couldn't possibly, so I'm going to have to handle a, a soldering iron in a minute, and that's going to get tricky. So since Friday, I don't know if you were with me on Friday. If not, do go and check that one out, because that was our first uh, dive into this thing. Um, the interesting things happened. Uh, first of all, it was harder than I thought, and I got a bit frustrated at times uh, because there were, I felt there were things missing from the documentation which were making it unnecessarily hard for me to work things out. Now, having reflected on that a little bit, that's that's just my desire for it to be easy. That's me pushing back against these opportunities to learn because I just want it to be to be simple and I don't want to look like an idiot not knowing what I'm doing. I've had to embrace that a little bit more and acknowledge the fact that I need to to take my time and I need to learn and the reason why this is not given to me on a plate is precisely because it encourages me to learn, to look, to work things out and I've certainly had to do a lot of that. So, thanks. So, my frustrations, if you like, uh, from last week were of my own making as much as anything else. And I will endeavour not to find myself in that state because I feel like, okay, I kind of get it now. I need to, uh, you know, to, to, to focus and expand and to look deeper and to try harder and all those sorts of things. However... I have also pointed out a couple of just tiny, tiny flaws, perhaps, in the documentation. I know that Moritz has been working on a sort of a version two in response to some of the trickiness that we came across, which is awesome. <laughs> Cause there are, because a little bit more help, um, just in those areas where, um, I mean, it's a classic situation where someone who knows a subject very well is writing documentation on it, will make you know unconscious assumptions about uh, people's understanding of things and that can often just leave these little gaps where you're reading through something and it just doesn't seem to quite all connect up because you don't have that background knowledge in your head to fill in those gaps and so the process of doing this luckily rather than just making me look stupid has actually been useful I think uh, for the project as a whole uh, for the documentation and hopefully hopefully for you good people at home so <laughs> so uh so yeah so that that was my vibe i think from last week but it was fascinating and good lord if i learned some stuff now can i recall all of that stuff no not necessarily 
but some of it and a lot of it will certainly be there now things have changed since last week i continued uh, working on the breadboard because simply because of the time that it takes and i knew that if i was to do another video starting off from where i left off before we're still not going to make it to the end and there's about what, five six hours of casual live streaming of me working on this breadboard working through the next bits uh, so you can go and check those out if you like but i would just see if i can do a brief summary from where we were to where I am now, and then we'll have a little tinker with this, the completed, more or less, VCO on the breadboard, and then we'll move to soldering it in for real. So that's exciting, I'm very excited about that. So, so, <laughs> so let me bring up the, the screen. there we go so you can see see where we are and see everything and see all of us all at once so that's lovely so on uh on the, the as far as the manual is concerned in fact let me just cut to that first of all this this is more or less where we were and where was that you ask yourselves well let's just come out a little bit and have a look oh by the way let me know if my audio is loud enough and things like that in the uh, in the chat that's very helpful uh, but yes yeah, so we were here we had placed uh, a bunch of smith triggers <laughs> whatever the heck they are we had placed two transistors which were working together to maintain the temperature within the system as well as acting as um, a control over the flow of resistance which changes ultimately the pitch of the oscillator oh i think that's right and we just added an op amp which we were using to on the way for some reason can't remember why on the way to the output which was then um uh, buffered so that none of the the voltage current resistance stuff was lost down the wrong tube yeah yeah i definitely understood it all definitely but that's sort of where we were okay so we looked at <laughs> uh, we looked at this Smith trigger. We looked at uh, buffering and coupling. That's where we use this op amp. And there's our op amp there. We worked out the batteries in order to power the thing, which was good. And I've done a little bit. Of, I've done a little bit of adjustment on that because I was so so annoyed. With it oh, over here look so annoyed with the, the batteries always coming out of the breadboard that i've soldered the end of the wires onto a proper patch wire so hopefully it will stay in a bit better and indeed they do so we we got through that we got through the idea of the negative rail because we need both um, a positive and a negative and a zero volts so that was important and that's what we're using two batteries for see i do remember some of this and then we talked about changing the frequency, which you can do by changing resistors or changing capacitors. But swapping out capacitors is not something you can do very easily. The levels of tab low, says Ken. Um, it's only because I'm talking to the camera. Uh, I think when my head's turned over here, it will, it will improve, I think. So, because it because it, it is right here, just trying to think, just making sure that I haven't left it down a little bit from before. No, it's kind of up as far as it would go. I will endeavour to speak more into it rather than turning to the camera. <laughs> so that'll be better if I face this way. Yeah. Okay. Good. I can also bring it closer to myself potentially. Potentially, we'll see. Anyway, so we talked about changing capacitors and changing resistors. And that brought us to this unexpected place for me where I thought we'd be using like a, a variable resistor of some kind. We actually use a transistor to change the resistance because it has an exponential, exponential output in response to voltage at its base. So that was exciting. I had no idea about that. And then to deal with temperature, 
we had to stick in another one this is still this first one Ooh. oh yeah and that as well well I'll get to the second transistor in a second then so we're putting this transistor with this pot in order to change the pitch because that pot changes the voltage at the base of the transistor and that's what allows more or less uh, magic through yeah got it good then we looked at the scaling because the the usable range within that knob was very very small and we want to be able to use a much greater range of voltage in order to get finer detail so to do that we we want we had to we used two resistors one like 25 times bigger than the other in order to create a voltage divider <laughs> and what that did is scaled the the voltage down to something which matches what's coming through the transistor i think roughly let's just keep going with it keep going with it So then we talked about temperature and using uh, kind of an, an, a mirrored uh, transistor. So you've got an NPN transistor used, which um, does one thing, go, goes up in response to voltage, and then we used a PMP one, which goes down in response to voltage, but they both change the same when dealing with temperature. The idea being that these two things, because one's going up and one's going down in response to temperature, they they both they cancel each other out essentially and that maintains the accuracy of the oscillator in a changing temperature fascinating stuff fascinating that was all of that i think <laughs> and slowly but surely our our breadboard was getting filled with stuff so i think we left it at this point where we were getting a temperature set scaled output of a sawtooth wave from our output which was awesome and we could change the pitch of it and it was fantastic from here it got pretty difficult and i spent a lot of time on monday i think it was working through the tuning now tuning oscillators is hard it's just it's just difficult it takes time and patience two things i rarely have in abundance um and you're in this process of using two uh, two things a, a knob and a, a trimmer sort of like the blue trimmer in there one second i just want to make sure we're seeing the same thing no you're looking at that at the moment right so let's go to our <laughs> let's go to this one where hopefully you'll be able to see everything okay good so yes yeah, so on to our breadboard here so we were using a pot and a trimmer here those two in combination to to tune it one taking the the root note down the other one kind of expanding it to fit across the five volt uh five octave range that we were trying to get i didn't get anywhere near it i found it really hard i managed to get it tuned to something like c4 and then up to c6 so a couple of volts worth of octaves but that was partially because i don't really have the right tools don't have the right sort of tuner the volume was too low to run the o tool the o tool uh, scope that i've got in euro rack so it it became a little bit of a frustration and that brings up um uh, a point i suppose about having the right tools for the job we'll come to that i think i'm not going to talk about it right now but uh, it became difficult, but eventually, through <laughs> through trial and error, I got a couple of octaves sounding about right together, and I thought, that's good enough, I'm going to carry on. Uh, but it is it's a difficult area, and I found this before when, when building kits, when you get to the calibration side, that it's always kind of like the most frustrating part of the build. But we're going to get to this again uh, once we've soldered the thing together, but at least we'll know that... When we've soldered the kit everything's in the right place and nothing is shorting each other out which is some of the trouble i was getting okay so
So we messed around with that. We then ignored uh, temperature because that's going to be a, a factor, but really in the kit, not on the breadboard. We also, I completely ignored the FM input and fine tuning knob because I think, again, this wasn't something we were going to do on the breadboard. It was just information about it. So then I got to wave shaping, sawtooth to pulse. Uh, because you want to have a sawtooth output and also having a square wave output. Now getting the square wave was easy. The difficulty was actually hearing it. <laughs> what we used, we used more of these op amps, which is in this, this second chip over here. To enable us to create uh, a simple waveform based upon uh, the sawtooth. As the sawtooth happened, as it was above a threshold, we got a positive, and then when it went beneath this threshold, we got a negative, and that gives us our square wave. Good, simple stuff. So, you know, that was, that was very positive, and I understood all of that, but then putting it together... on here I ran into a problem now the problem was that I couldn't hear the square wave and the problem was that I didn't really understand enough of what I put into the breadboard to know why and all I knew was that out of the output that the sawtooth was coming out of I had no square wave despite the fact I'd followed the breadboard everything matched up I was not getting anything and I was reading at the bottom here, it says, be careful, don't try to listen to it yet, because it's super loud and might damage your headphones. Now, I know it says, don't listen to it yet, but what I saw was headphones. Therefore, you're getting an output. And the manual says you can check it on, a, on an oscilloscope, which, of course, I don't really have. Uh, just hook it up to the comparator's output. Now, I didn't, I didn't grab hold of that sentence, and that was very, very important, because all I could fathom was that I was not getting an output and why was that so I went back through it took bits out put them back in again no it's right it's right everything is right in reflecting the breadboard but why can't I hear it and then at that point I realized that uh, here in the op amp the output of the op amp that's creating the uh, the square wave is this pin 7 and pin 7 is connected to bugger all Can you see that? Can you see a mouse? If I put a mouse over here, is it also picking up the mouse? One second, I'll see it in a minute. Just wondering if that's useful. Can you? See? No, barely. Who knows? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Anyway, on the TL074, pin 7 is the left hand pin on the top where you can see 100k written above it. Or you might be able to see that. It's a little small. That's okay. <laughs> Just keep going, you fool. Right, okay. So that is the output of the op amp, and it's not connected to anything at all. So I sort of struggled with this, going, I don't understand why it's not connected. How, how are we supp supposed to hear it? If it's not connected so you know my brain started cheering on this and i only saw this when i came back to it today i mean i'd given up on monday i'd got this far couldn't hear it my brain hurt in fact i actually went to bed for two hours after this before i did my live stream with uh, with stephen on on the evening because my brain was so frazzled i just had to shut down because i could not my brain could not cope with anything else so anyway, coming back to this this morning, I went back through the breadboard, back through all the bits, looked at the diagram for the op amp and realized that this, this output here was not, was not connected. So I thought, well, surely if I'm going to connect it, all it needs to do is go to the, the output. So it must be coming out of here. So I connected it over to the patch socket over on the far right uh, by plugging it in next to where that really small patch wire is. And it worked. Bloody hell, I thought. So, so I took the left-hand wire from that little one and plugged that into pin 7, and there it was, working. Brilliant. There's an output. Yes, it was louder than a sawtooth, but not terribly, terribly loud. So 
Uh, I then felt immensely pleased with myself that I had reasoned my way through and discovered the solution to a problem that I believed to be there. When in fact, it wasn't really a problem because it was mentioned in the manual that the output of the comparator is what you would stick your oscillator to. And that's what pin 7 is. It's the output of the comparator. Yeah? So, even though I thought I'd found a, a glaring error in all of this, it, was, it wasn't a glaring error. It was just a level of clarification which... Um, wasn't working for me and I needed more I needed a, a bit more hand holding I needed a nice big arrow or some further explanation but I worked it out man I did <laughs> worked it out I always use mains voltage if that's if that's your question whenever I can not really okay so that's so that's where I started working from this morning and uh, it was fantastic <laughs> and from there we then did uh, once I got my square wave working we then do a little bit of pulse width modulation which was quite good fun sticking that in uh, using another op amp um, you know all the time this pin 7 is still not connected to anything on the breadboard here and then we talked about the output volume because the output on the saw was very small and on the pulse was very high and so we needed to put in um, a non-inverting amplifier in order to reduce uh, no in order to to boost the sawtooth and we need to put in a voltage divider to bring down the pulse so that in quite a shock <laughs> came to this breadboard here let me just bring it up a little bit la larger see with this one it's, com it's not completely different it was just lots of changes that to start with, you look at the previous one and you go, right, yeah, okay, following this through, following this through. Then you go to this one and you go, oh, okay, so I've got to put another thing here. Then you go, oh, what's happened to the uh, to the AC coupling capacitor? Where the heck has that gone? And where's this bit gone? And things had certainly changed. It all got a little bit rearranged around here, which was, which was quite heavy on one's mind and trying to interpret and still visualize where all the different bits were because because it had been built up over time i i felt like i i compartmentalized it so i knew that this bit here generated the uh, the the pitch and the and the sawtooth wave and this bit here was the buffer you know this bit here was the the two transistors this bit here was a square wave and the pulse width modulation etc so when those bits sort of became a little bit mixed up it did get um, a bit of a struggle but anyway put it all together <laughs> and i could get the sawtooth output but i still couldn't get the square wave output which now had its own part of the circuit its own individual output and this was most perplexing um, and I looked at it and I looked at it and I took things out, put things back, took things out, put things back. And I realized that still that pin number seven, still not connected. And it has to be connected to something. It must be. There has to be something that it's connected to. So um, I racked my brains, went through the schematics, went through all of the diagrams to try to work it out. And try to reason with myself where exactly this thing was. So I go back to the schematic here. Because this now makes a certain amount of sense. It didn't to start with. You're looking at it going, whoa, I don't know. But these are four op amps. So these four things here. Are, so these triangles are the plus and minuses in it. Because you're not, you're not seeing me point at it, are you? Because currently I'm on just that bit there yeah right so these these four triangles oh there is a mouse good yeah right okay i'll point at it then so these four triangles over here these are the op amps and so i could look at this follow it through on where those pin connections were on the op amp which was down here somewhere that's the triggers this is the op amp. So I can see the plus and the minus and the output, plus and minus and the output. Do you see? Yeah. So using that and using the schematic, 
I could see that, oh yeah, the 47K resistor is, is there and that's connected to ground, yeah, and that's connected to 100K, yeah, okay, that's fine, that's going to the saw out, good. One over here, okay, so there's 1K going to the pulse out, or we're not actually putting the 1Ks in on the breadboard, but by the by, and I could see the 68 one coming off a potentiometer and the 14K going to ground, I had the 100K going to a potentiometer, all of that worked, except for here which you can't see me use my finger on here. So this one, the output should be going through a 100K resistor to the 68K. And that just didn't exist. It was not there. This is our pin 7 here, which is not connected to anything. It's right next to a 100K resistor, but that 100K is this one here going off to the pot. So it was this one that was missing. Um... And so, <laughs> and so once I'd made that decision, I think, things started coming together. But of course not immediately, because my bloody batteries kept falling out every time I was plugging something in. And it didn't work immediately. But after a bit of shuffling, a bit of fussing around, convincing myself that that was the problem, I took a 100k resistor and plugged it between pin 7 and whatever it was, the 68k was on. And it came to life. Thank goodness. So... That was my journey up until um, this afternoon or this morning. This afternoon, I think it was. This afternoon. So that was a bit of a journey. But as I say, I feel really, um, I don't know, I feel superhuman in the fact that I was able to work through this schematic. I was able to work through where the, where the lines were on the op amp and just reason out what was missing and what the problem was and that for me is a phenomenal bit of troubleshooting <laughs> i can't quite believe that i got through it uh because on monday I was, I was all for giving it up really but um i got there and i i resolved the problem and now it works so that's the story up to now which took far too long to tell but never mind it felt important so let's just go back to where we currently are and I'll just demonstrate, demonstrate an output. <laughs> right, so, okay, we have, oh, that's not, let's be careful, right. Um, I've got a slightly different setup, which I'll also show you in a second. So I've got positive, positive goes into there. See, look at how great these little things are now. Negative goes in to there. That negative goes into there. And that positive goes into there and it stays. And listen to that. Can you hear that all right? That's probably too loud. I'll turn that down a bit. I'm evolving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe it was deliberate. Oh, is it really, really loud? Okay. I'm sorry. I'll turn it down a lot. This is electronics, man. You've got to expect, uh, you know, booms and, and high-pitched bits. Yeah, all right, all right. We get it, we get it. So this is the square wave, right? <laughs> I'm very sorry. And this is the uh, pulse width modulation. But you can't see very well, but it's this knob here. This is the pitch. By way of an LFO, I've got in this cable here, I can give it a little bit of movement.
and by increasing this knob here, which has a danger of killing everything, I can increase how far that goes. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> right, so at this point, I'll turn it down to nothing for a minute. So, so that that is a working VCO pitch and pulse width modulation going on from the square wave. This output here is the sawtooth. That also works, uh, no problem. But uh, I wanted to just let you know. Or give you an example of a of a oscill um, of an oscilloscope solution and a tuning solution, which we'll probably use later. So uh, I've been thinking about this whole oscilloscope business. Yeah, I don't have one. It's a big chunky piece of gear normally, um, and it doesn't it doesn't feel necessary. However, it's seemingly that it might be necessary. <laughs> so. Um, uh, I was talking to uh, to Ian and, and Ken about this earlier uh, when I was uh, live streaming my other little bits, and they talked about getting one of those sort of Chinese oscilloscopes that cost about thirty quid from Amazon with a little screen, and that is probably the solution. But if anybody has some good recommendations on a, just a simple, cheap oscilloscope, which is going to be great for this, so I don't want a, a Mordax data, I don't want to use my O tool. They're they're fussy and expensive and large, and I don't want a proper os um, oscilloscope. I just want something that I can sit here and plug into. So uh, as I say, if anyone's got any recommendations, that would be great, and I will get that together for the next one. Uh, also, someone suggested that it might be useful to do a, this is the basic kit stuff that you need, which, yeah, is good. I mean, there's detail of that within this manual, which is excellent. It gives you a whole list uh, after going through each of the components, which is also really great. There's some fabulous information here, stuff which would have been helpful for me to read, you know, last time while we're doing it. Uh, but because I was going through it in a very linear fashion, I didn't really skip ahead to the appendixes like I perhaps could have done. Um, but that's all great information there. Fabulous, 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 fabulous. And in a minute, we'll get to tools. So it talks about multimeters. It talks about oscilloscopes and uh, other bits and pieces that you might need. And that's really, really very helpful. But yes, I will do a video on the basic bits that you need as well as soon as I've got an oscilloscope um that that'll work yeah a dso 138 exactly that that's exactly the sort of thing i'm after i just wondered if there was any particular one that would be useful yes the o tool is an oscilloscope it's just a bit small it's fussy i need to bring up a case power supply to power it all i just need something that i can that can knock around without fearing it being damaged and also it's good at some things it's not great at others i find with the o tool funnily enough so yeah, exactly. Could you use a software scope? Yes, you could. Now, this is what I'm going to suggest that if you don't have an oscilloscope, your best bet is to use um, this from Melda Productions. So this is, um, uh, Melda Productions is uh, just a software plugin people. They do a whole bunch of free plugins that you can accidentally install all at once so that your whole system is covered in like, hundred plugins that you're never going to use but if you go through the installer a little bit more calmly you can just select a couple and there's a spectrum analyzer which is great there's an oscilloscope there's also a tuner and all of these things are, are, are great and you can just run them as plugins within your door so here I am plugged into the front of an audio interface which gives me lots of gain options so it doesn't matter what the output is like and it's just going straight into Bitwig and giving me uh, a, a display so I can see the sort of waveform. What it's not going to do really is not going to let me measure voltage in particular because I don't think that's what it's for. <laughs> I don't think that's what it does. Um, and also it's going to be very dependent on your audio interface as to whether it can accept a flat voltage. It would have to be DC coupled in order to do so and most of them are not going to be. So using software as a scope is visually useful but not that helpful for uh, for everything that you might want to do with an oscilloscope flat voltages being the the key one really 
But it's uh, if you've got nothing else, it's a great way to do it. And this is a far better tuner than the, than the O2, I would say. So you can hear that there. So this is actually as low as I'm getting at the moment, which is F4. But don't ask me to tune it again. I'll do that later. But then you can see the modulation change. Of the LFO and so on. Super lovely, great. Let me plug in the sawtooth. Uh, see, there you go. That's all right, isn't it? And they're both at a similar level. Now, if I was to plug a keyboard into there, I could actually play. I could play a tune. We're not going to. We need to move on. But I think, hopefully, that has demonstrated. Plug that out of there. That the VCO at a basic level. Not lose bits uh, is functional it's working it's on the breadboard and we did it we nailed it <laughs> right it sounds good thank you ken i know you've always got my back now i can ignore these um these batteries now and the breadboard so how am I going to then start tackling the next bit that's the question so let's bring this go past all the bits all the bits blah blah blah, blah lots of stuff because now we're getting to the bit I'm a bit more um, familiar with a bit more comfortable with where I don't feel I'm going to be learning something every time let's get rid of that out of there So I'm going to put that out of the way over there. Hopefully I haven't dragged anything off that. What is this? Why do I need that? Let's get that. Oh no, careful of the... Oh dear. Oh heavens. Okay. So, before we start building, it says, have a look at the schematics on the next page. Now this is scary. This is a bit scary. Yeah, a hand-built molten modular VCO. I reckon, I reckon two grand, two grand a pop, worth a go. Comes with an NFT manual. That'll do it. Right. So we're gonna look at the schematics. You'll notice a few components. No, I probably won't have been added. Um, uh, names like R1, C1, VT1, DD1, etc. Values next to them have they have denominations. They help us identify components. Yes, that's all very very helpful. Uh, XS1 and XS5 are input and output jack sockets. There's a power connector. Stocky diodes. Double secure the reverse polarity power supply protection. Good. Diodes pass current only in one direction. Yes. Okay. We have two 10 ohm resistors. Yeah, and the plus and minus 12 volt rails with decoupling capacitors C1 to C4. These capacitors serve as energy reservoirs that keep them, oh, excuse me, that keep the module's internal supply voltages stable in case there's any fluctuations. Okay, so what you're saying is there's more to it when you're actually building a module, you've got to think about. Um, Voltage fluctuations, got to think about people plugging in things the wrong way around, which you don't have to worry about on a breadboard because, hey, you're just making things smoke for the fun of it. 
Uh, the large 47 microfarad pair compensates for low frequency fluctuations, while C3 and C4 filter out radio frequencies. This is crazy stuff. All these things you've got to think about. High frequency spikes from switching power supplies and quick spikes created by other modules. Wow. Often another component is a ferrite bead. Yeah, yeah. Which is used instead of a 10 ohm resistor. Okay. There's no clear consensus among designers which one works best. I've often had to solder in ferrite beads having no real no no real knowledge of what they do other than something to do with electrical interference. But for analog modules that work mostly in the audio range, resistors are considered to be superior. Fair enough. Another advantage of 10 ohm resistors is that they will act like slow fuses in case there's an accidental short circuit. Helpful. It will get hot and smoke and finally break. Yes, good. So here, here's the schematic. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not convinced that's going to be that useful to us just now. I don't know. I mean, it's interesting to look at. I mean, I personally, I found the the handwritten one to be great. I could follow that through. This one, who knows? Let's just bring it up a bit larger. Obviously, you can be following along at home if you have. If you have the manual open but just looking through so we've got a pot here temperature is that a temperature thing could be uh, with resistors coarse tuning with the fine tuning also coming in this is the input for CV change and for FM CV, okay. And this then goes into the base of this pair of transistors. Let me use the mouse rather than my fingers, I think. Pair of transistors. <laughs> so that much I understand. There's a wiggly thing. Whoops. There's a wiggly thing here. Not sure what that is. Oh, yeah. Or oh, do I? Is that... That's the... That's the AC coupled bit, I think. Or, no. Now, anyway, moving on over here, <laughs> we then get the uh, whole bunch of op amps that we talked about. Um, there's one op amp which is taking the, the sawtooth wave and turning that into a square wave. There's another one which sorts out the pulse width modulation, which is here. Another one which boosts the, the sawtooth and one that reduces the square wave. So that's the, the booster for the sawtooth and this is the, re, the reducing one for the pulse wave. I think that's right. And that's our schematic. There's other stuff on here as well, but we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> right, let's get to it. Ooh. Good, right. So there's some capacitors which are additional decoupling capacitors. You inspect the PCB. Well, let's do that, shall we? Let's stop talking about, about it and actually start getting to it. Now, is there only the one? That's the front panel. Not a lot's going to happen on that. I wonder if there's there standoffs involved. How is that all going on? Don't know. Don't mind at the moment. Let's just put, that, put this over here. We shall see. So this here is our PCB. So when you come to, a, to soldering something, you tend to find 
that where the screen print is, is the side that your component's going to go. I need my uh, magnifiers, because it's a little bit small on here. So every, every square or rectangle, those are resistors, and they're all labelled with the value. Uh, they're also numbered as well, although there's no specific bit of materials to tell us what that is what they refer to although they're probably on yeah they're on the schematic so the numbers of the resistors like um, r13 for instance r7 those are also labeled on the schematic so it allows us to know exactly where they are we've got diodes on here with a with a line capacitors the round ones being electrolytic capacitors we'll get to those chips go in the middle And then the hardware goes on the back or on the front. So it's all on a single PCB, unless I've done something seriously wrong. The only reason I won't worry about it is because there's a, it's like a picture of three. But no, it is just the one. Both sides and the front panel. That's what we're thinking of. Yes. Okay. Now, this is an interesting thing is that it says that there's um, unused inputs of DD1, DD1B to DD1F. So we can find those. No, it doesn't matter. But anyway, it says in here that there's a, a bunch of things that won't get used <laughs> that are just connected to ground. Um, uh, those are unused, but there's also some fake test points or a kludge area, which is TP11 to TP42. That's actually that what I need to be looking for, isn't it? Test point. Test points, you know, TP, test point. Got it. Yeah, yeah, right. Understood, understood. And what those are for are for future developments or custom mod modifications. So the idea being that once I've built this, I might I might want to stick something else on it, like, for instance, a uh, voltage range switch or a sync input. Interesting. I don't think that's very likely, though, is it? But you never know, do you? So before we start soldering, it says we recommend printing out the part placement diagrams with designators and values because some of the PCBs are rather densely populated and this will help you avoid mistakes. So the hardest thing I've done today is get my printer to work. Bloody printers. And so this is a printout of the screen print, I suppose, of the board, which we can refer to to make sure we've got things right if we can't quite identify it on the board or not so that's very very useful any kind of visual indication of where things go is very very helpful when soldering when you're not sure exactly what you're doing and you're just trying to put the bits together it's so good that's a good thing i'm going to keep that to hand now excuse me um probably pretty close to hand <laughs> where's best place to put that don't know batteries don't need you anymore let me just uncouple these so I don't accidentally fry myself. Great stuff. Put those over there somewhere. I could turn my soldering iron on. Now I do have a decent soldering iron. Uh, I did start off with a 10 quid soldering iron, which was a very not very good. But I was able to solder, and that's the main function, really. Um, but after a while, I just thought, well, sod it. If I'm going to do a lot of this, let's spend a hundred quid on a on a soldering iron, and so I did. And it's it's been brilliant, and I have to say, it makes all the difference in the world. Just having a decent holder, you know, <laughs> makes a lot of difference. So I'm just need to be really careful that I don't melt things like my 
surface or the microphone, etc. Is that? I don't know. Don't know what's going on with that. Do I have enough? Yeah, I've got enough give. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, having a decent, a decent one, one with the display, so you know how how hot it is, is helpful because it gives you some kind of assurance that it's at the right temperature. The temperature it seems to be is three hundred and fifty degrees C. I came to that. I was using it at three ninety, which was brilliant. But when I built the uh, the Dreadbox Disto Dystonia, they strongly recommended 350 degrees. And so I, I took it down to that, and that still seems to be pretty great. So I'm sticking with that. I'm sure you all have reasons why. I don't think it's a Hakko clone. I think it's a Hakko. <laughs> it's an FX888D. Right, but you can start with absolutely any soldering iron. Don't be deceived into thinking you need to spend a lot of money on gear. So how are we going to tackle this? Well, thankfully, the manual has absolute step-by-step -step guides in here, which is just brilliant. Our only tricky bit is going to be working out what the value of all the resistors are again. But, you know, I've got my meter to hand and that's not going to be a, a major problem. So it suggests putting the VCO PCB into a PCB holder, which is a lovely thing to have. I don't have one. I just freeform it over this piece of green stuff. Um, it says you can also put it on a couple of top of a couple of spacers. I'm doing what spacers? I don't know. It's just going to sit here, right? Because I'm going to be handling it a lot. So uh, it says I usually start with lower horizontally placed components, start populating, bend the resistors, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, start with the lowest thing. So the lowest thing is always going to be resistors and diodes. So what we need to do is find all the resistors, put them into the holes. Now, this is, is just going to take some time. Uh, Uh, I the big question is it a big question? It's not a big question for me, and I just use the, the the solder solder stuff. This is I'll tell you what my solder is. If that's if that's the sort of thing people like to hear about, this is multi core, uh, uh, 0.7 millimeter. Um, Ursin 362. I don't know. Is that does that mean anything? I mean, I was I was just buying solder randomly off off Amazon, I think, and found one I really liked. So I just keep hitting the reorder button whenever I need some more. So that's what I'm going with. Uh, 0.7 seemed to be a good size, in, as far as as far as I found it. Um, it is leaded. Uh, I have tried using lead-free solder, and that does work. It just takes seems to take longer. It's harder to melt, but it's also a lot less poisonous. So you know there is that. Okay, so we need to start populating the board, and as I say, this is just going to take some time because usually I would, I would um, do the go fast trick, time lapse this. I'm just going to have to go. Uh, have I got, got to wipe it down with an oily rag? Is that the idea? Where do you get oily rags from? I mean, is it something that you just find in your dad's shed? Is, but then I'm the dad these days and I don't have an oily rag. I don't I don't know where, where it emerges from. Do I, like... I don't know, get, a, get some kind of cloth, and pour some oil on it, don't know. Anyway, that's a, that's a whole, that's a discussion for another day. Let me get that mouse out of the way. So what I want to be doing is sticking the right things in here. The right resistors. Let's see if we can start with R1. Or should I start from the top and go to the bottom? Is it really going to matter? The important thing, because I don't have 
a bit of materials to tick things off as I go. So I guess I just I just populate. So what of these do I know? Okay. So I'm going to just take all of the patch wires out so that I can see my components. Okay, I'm just going to start at the top of the board and work my way down, I think. I think that's what I'm going to do. So these are tens, I think. <laughs> or it could be a hundred. Oh, darn it. Those are one Ks. Those are a hundred Ks. Right, so because I can't recognize resistors on site, I'm just going to measure to make sure. Okay, that's 10 ohms, those two. So I get a feeling I'm going to be doing quite a bit of this. See, with a with like a, a list, a bill of material, something showing you what they all are, it makes them easier to identify. But because I've, I've got no list to go by, I just have to sort of keep stopping and measuring and checking and that kind of thing. So it doesn't matter which way round resistors go. They just go in the hole. So there's a 10. That goes in there. There's another one for R14 and R15. All right, just a point of order. <laughs> the uh, right, the picture, the picture here on the two uh, solder reels or whatever is not the same as this board. It is not the same. Don't get fooled looking at that, going that's not even remotely similar. No, it's not. So, oh, let's go down to the next one. This is what we're looking at. So that's a bit better because now I can see that. I can visually check that those are similar to what I'm putting in. I'm going to do the resistors first. I'll do the diodes secondly. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's good. They're moving down here. We need a 47k and a 100k. Now I've got lots of those 100ks. The 47k I think is this one, but of course I'm going to have to measure it because actually we still got this here. I can bring this down. To the last, what's it? This one, is this the one? Yeah. I should be able to pick up where the 47K one is. You know, I can't see that now. <laughs> did I ever have a 47K in there? Maybe I didn't. Maybe it's one of these other ones. Yeah, probably. All right, keep going, keep going. Probably this one. So 
Oh, it's of no use. Oh no, it looks like one meg. Those are hundreds, that's 1k. That's a 33. That's a 1 meg, that's a 1k5. That's a 14, 69. 47. Oh, I see it, it's this one. Yoink! Okay, good. But I will keep testing as I go. So I don't want to get it wrong. And I will not be frustrated by crocodile clips. I won't. 47. Cool, yeah. Then uh, 100k. I know those ones. Can fit in there. Another hundred K. Goes in there. Sixty eight. Which is this one and this one. See, what I, I guess I would ideally like to do is be able to look at this and as I'm putting resistors in, know exactly what it is they're going into because I've, I've reverted back to my previous state, which is just following the, the instructions, putting them in and soldering them without really any clear idea of, of their purpose. Even though I've been learning all about it, I still come here and find it difficult to see. But, you know, I've got to be... A little bit generous to myself and that this is the first time I've done this the first time I've looked at this in this way so I can't expect to grasp it all completely overnight do you know what I mean so so give us a little bit of grace on all of that All right, so need a 68 and a couple of hundreds up here. So this is the other 68. And those aren't hundreds. That one is. The same banding yet. Now, when I'm building the Deckard's Dream, doing those voice cards with a thousand like resistors on each, you do get the hang of what a resistor looks like by its banding and stuff, and that does become more obvious and more important at this stage. Um, you know, it's 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 information in my head that I lose really really quickly. So this is a hundred here. Yeah. Ba ba ba. Okay. K. Yes, that's hundred K. Yep. That's 
That's 100k, I used to 47. That's 100k, yep. Now I appreciate that for some people, putting components into a PCB is kind of an art form. And that's cool and everything. For me, I'm kind of a bit more pragmatic about it. I enjoy doing it, but you know, I'm very much a good enough when it comes to uh, this kind of thing. You need a, a one meg. You need a one meg down there as well. That's a one k. Do I have a one meg on the board? I don't think I, yes I do up there this one I think let's try it out so you know there's levels to these things you can polish every connection you can polish every leg of a resistor and that's cool you do that thing Ugh. I'm just gonna stuff them in right, so this one make was part of the the transistor business uh, yeah right okay so it's going to go there and look it looks like there's a transistor going to go next to it but obviously on a pcb the traces go all over the place it's not a grid like it is on a breadboard so you don't automatically necessarily know exactly where the connections are going but this is relatively simple. You can follow the traces pretty well, I think. Okay, coming down, coming down. One five K. That was over here. Try to keep it in shot. Two more hundred Ks. Which I've got here. I'll at least put them side by side the same way around so they look nice. Come on. Little bit of effort, please. Little bit of effort. The other one, Meg. And I've got three left now. Those are the 1K, so that must be the one. Oh, no, I've got two over there. <laughs> what are they? Oh, that's a 14K. Isn't it? And a 68K. Don't I need those somewhere? Where have I missed out those bits then? Don't worry about it. Okay, so let's do these one Ks. This, I think, is the other one, Meg. Yeah. Now that appears, at the moment, to be all the resistors. Even though 
I have a couple left. Three left. I'm sure that's of no consequence. Right, let's go back to this. I'm just going to check it with the the photograph to see that it's it's more or less right. So I don't need those those four. So uh, two there, those two there, those two there. Slightly different, but that's okay because they're different colours. The banding is still correct. That's there. That's there. That one. That one. This one. One and two and two and that one. Cool. Right, so we actually get to some soldering. What time is it? Good Lord, we're an hour and a quarter in. And we're going to do some soldering. Are we going to do it? Are we going to be here till flipping midnight? Let's hope not. I mean, but I want to get it done. So let's get on with it. So for soldering purposes, the manual says you can solder from the bottom if you're a bit rubbish, or you can solder from the top if you're awesome. I'm going to go for the I'm a bit rubbish because I like soldering from the bottom. That always makes sense to me. Whenever I try to solder anything from the top, I melt stuff. I, you know, inadvertently melt other things. So I'm going for the, the traditional, I've bent the legs like so, so that they don't fall out. Um, I know that these should probably be under an exacting amount of tension uh, in order to, to get the optimum height above the PCB board. Oh, I have no idea what I'm talking about. So I just bend the legs, right? And then I, I jam in some uh, some solder and soldering iron heat and uh, jobs are good. And that's the plan. So let's stick this down where you can see it and I'll give that a go. Now, the next thing I need to do is turn on a fan because I'm using leaded um, solder. Uh, you could use some kind of extraction system. You could sit yourself in a fume cupboard, all sorts of different ways of doing this. I use uh, this fan, can you see that? It's just a, I don't know, a 10 quid plastic fan, desktop fan, USB powered that I turn on. You might be able to hear that on the microphone. Hopefully that's not going to interfere too badly. Uh, let's see if that's, that's test. No, it's all right. Uh, but all the fan is doing is blowing the fumes away so I'm not breathing them in the whole time. You know, that's the plan. So, get that out of the way. You need to make sure your area is clear. I mean, I've got cables and whatnot going on because of this. I'm um, cameras and shit, so I'm, I can only do so much. But I do have, I think, a clear road. Now, the difference between a sponge and, a, and this, I don't really know. This stuff seems to be good. It just sort of takes the crap off the end of the soldering iron because there's a lot of crap on the end of the soldering iron if you're soldering like I do, which is usually to put a load of crap on the end. So jamming it in there seems like a good thing. Sticking it in the sponge every now and again seems like a good thing. It just seems like a healthy way to approach it. <laughs> so uh, let's just get my eye in. I'll try not to speak while I do this, just so I can kind of get on with it. Otherwise, I just get myself distracted. So all I'm going to do is solder all of these legs, and I'll talk to you when I'm done. Uh, hopefully, um, my head's not in the way. Is that if I stick my head down here? Is that going to be in the way? No, it should be fine. All right, go with it. So I apply. He says that, and then he starts speaking straight away. God, jeez. Anyway, I apply the end of the soldering iron to the leg and the pad. That's the plan. See, I could bring this potentially in. I'm overheating it now. So you can see it a little bit better. There's a bit of light reflection, but hey. Oops, what the heck. So put the end of the uh, soldier line in against the leg and the pad and then present some solder. And it should go. And you kind of get a feel for it. You, it's sort of just, it's a lovely feeling when that solder goes in. And it kind of just feels about right. And you end up leaving a bit of a volcano behind. And it's, you know, it's easy. I mean, I'm getting solder on the end of the soldering iron. Yeah, well, big deal. Call the police or something. Works for me. And I can always clean it a little bit. So you present the solder, take the solder off. Then take off the soldering iron. 
So it's iron, solder, off solder, off iron, that kind of thing. Getting to a bit of a rhythm with it. can't get your soldering iron in through the legs, bend the legs. Is that still on camera? Yep. Safety goggles is the other thing I haven't mentioned, but I mean, I'm wearing these um, magnifying glasses, which work kind of as safety goggles at the same time because they're protecting my eyes because I'm looking through them. But it's really not worth risking getting solder in your eye because that, that's kind of the end of your eye. So thinking about that suddenly, I'm thinking I should put the safety specs on as well, maybe. Uh, in fact, I will do that. Just to go a bit more belt and braces because these are relatively narrow and don't protect your eye fully. So I'm going full protection. There's always one. Good, give it a dab, give it a poke, jam it back in its thing. That looks pretty good. It's pretty good to me. Turn it back over, they will seem to be all right. Nothing's wobbling. Then what you need to do is get at it with your uh, pair of pliers, pair of snippers or something just to take all those legs off. Uh, again, this is an opportunity to take your eye out. So safety specs are, are useful or just kind of stick your finger over them to stop them twanging everywhere. I mean, I used to quite enjoy letting them twang everywhere, but then I started getting them in my feet because they'd end up on the floor and they'd end up stuck in the end of my toe. And that's not fun, not fun for anyone. So I tend to do less of the uh, leg spinning fireworks. Now I remember when I built my first module, the Turing machine I think it was, it never actually said when to snip the legs. And so I didn't, and I almost had the entire module built with this huge forest of legs underneath before I was brave enough to snip any off. Because, you know, I'm really good at following instructions. I don't like to do something if I'm not told to. <laughs> Which is like a major lack of initiative, I suppose. But hey, I bet you're wishing for the time lapse now, aren't you? God, this guy doesn't stop running on. Okay. Lovely. Look at that. Lovely, 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 lovely. Now all these legs don't need to be here. I have a, an old 
tray thing. I stick them in down there. That's good. What's next? The diodes that I could have put on at the same time, but I did not. So those are, I've got big thick ones here. And I've got a little one here, twangy one there, which is input from before. So my understanding is I've got two at the top here. VD1 and VD2. And where's the other one going to be? Down here, VD3. Do these have anything written on them? Just about, but I can't read it. <laughs> 505819. Yeah, 5819. 5819 is printed on the board. Good, 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 good. Who doesn't clean their boards? I don't clean my boards. I don't. No, I don't clean my boards. Right. So the line on here is goes with the the line that's on the diode itself. So that's going to go that way around. They are big, thick, chunky things going there. That's the right way around. Match it up with the picture. Yeah, it's the right way around. This one, lines at the bottom. Goes around like that. Pull it in. Nice. Yeah, lovely. And then this little squitty one goes down here. The black line lines up with the line on the board. Like so. That is the three diodes, I believe. Dun, dun, dun. Yep, okay. I will solder those fellas in. Probably need a bit more heat because of the thickness of these legs. Good. I'm sorry if you can hear me breathing. I have terrible sinuses. That looks good. Oh, look, that's a bit sticky outy. Never mind. I'm sure we can cope with that. Good. That's that first page. Moving on. So it says next insert the dip socket. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. PCBs are double sided. Doesn't matter which side you solder. Bloody 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 blah. Solder from the bottom. Resistors and diodes inserted. Okay. So it says next go with the dip sockets rather than the capacitors. Now the reason for this is because you're trying to do it in height order because it just makes things simpler when you're turning things over to try to solder them. So the height of this uh, IC socket or dip socket, is that what they're called? I don't know. Is lower than sticking in one of these. Where do these go? Something like that. See, the capacitors are slightly higher. So if you were to put the capacitors in first, these orange fellas, then when you try to put that in and turn it upside down, it's just all going to fall out. So do all these first. So these fit in. You've got a little nodule 
I mean, there's, this is just a holder for plugging this in, so it doesn't actually matter, of course, because it's not wired to anything. But you want to line up the little nodule that's out of there with the nodule that's on the screen print so that you can then line up the nodule of the chip that goes on it. Got it? Good. Ooh. That is a never important, I find. <laughs> uh, this one goes this way round. They both go the same way, in fact. Which was different to the breadboard. They went in opposite directions. So, in order to solder these in, you have to magic it upside down without them falling out. Now, when I was doing some soldering with Look Mum No Computer, he bent them so that they stayed in. I find that hard. In fact, that was just stuck into my thumb. But it does sort of work. I mean, it works enough to keep them in there. And then when you turn it upside down and lie it down, it should then come through flat. Then what you do, you solder one leg, one leg on each, and just check that it's, it's not all askew. So you can do that by sort of put, applying some pressure in a couple of places to the board. Obviously if I pipe pressure there, it's tipped up, so that's going to be all wonky. So I want to apply pressure here, just, just enough add a little bit hold it take that off do the same here try to hold it so it's going to be flat add some solder try to take that off while it's still flat and then have a look see that's not too bad can you see that they're relatively flat so with that being used as a bit of a guide of stability the rest should just go in nicely and all you've got to do is sold all the way along you can solder ICs directly to the board if you want in fact, sometimes you have to if it doesn't come with a holder or if you've completely stuffed it up like I have once or twice and you've had to cut the IC holder or the dip holder off the board. You then got no choice but to solder the chip directly on. But obviously if there's a problem, it's more difficult. you'll probably end up killing the chip rather than just the holder if you get it all horribly wrong. Okay, check it for shorts, by which we mean any two pins which have solder running between them. Now I've got two here that didn't really take a whole lot of solder. I'm just going to give them another quick blast. That one as well while I'm at it. Because when you come back to it when it doesn't work, those are usually the first places that you look and you reflow the solder on all those bits. Okay, good. Those two are in. Are they the right way around? I believe so. They should be, whoops, that way pointing down. <laughs> Is that right? I did that right? Yeah, I think I did that right. Okay, good, 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 good. So that's the sockets. Then you do the little orange capacitors. Now, little orange capacitors, I think they're all the same. So it doesn't matter which ones I use. They all say 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. So that's these, these orange capacitors here.
doesn't matter which way round they go either because they're not charged in that way they're not mm, what's the word I don't know not electrolytic goes there this last one there checking that that matches up Turn upside down and give it a bit of solder. your boards wobbling all over the place you could always stop and <laughs> do something about it or just carry on regardless a little bit too much solder on that but that all looks okay that all looks okay Good, looking good. Right. Place a PCB on spaces and set capacitors, solder them like you did before. Okay, yeah, blah blah. Da -da -da. Next up, the NTC thermistors and transistors. Make sure you place the transistors in their designated spots. Also, they need to be properly aligned with a marked outline on the silk screen. Orientation is critical. Complete this step by soldering vertically placed resistors. What? <laughs> What's that you say? Oh, I'll get to that in a minute. Oh, look, 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 look. Look at that. Vertically placed resistors. These spare resistors, I weren't sure where they were going. They are on here. Look, R12 and R21 is like vertical like. That means you have them sticking out of the board. Oh, wow. I don't think I've ever done one. <laughs> a project that has those. How interesting. See, that's why I didn't spot them from before. So they're not missing. They just I just hadn't quite got to them yet. Um, anyway, what was I doing first? Yeah, the, the let's do the transistors first. Right, there's two of them. They are side by side down the bottom here. And it's be it's going to be important we get them around the right way. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't. I was sitting here wondering how on earth am I going to know which one is which. Now they are labelled on the board. Uh, the BC548 and the BC558. So thank you for that. Otherwise, I would have no clue as to which was which. So I'm going to take this one out. This is the don't remember one. <laughs> Does it have it written on? Yeah, this is the 548. 548, 558, 548. Four eight is on this side. The screen print is in the shape of what it should be, is in the shape of the top of it. And all you've got to do is wangle the legs into the right sort of shape. So you stick the base one out a little bit, bring those in. This is the five four eight. This is definitely five four eight. 
goes that way around. Following the pattern, rock it down, kind of, so it's as snug as you can make it. Nice. The other one, whoop. five, five, eight. Moves its leg a little bit forward. Goes in there. Snug it down. They're facing each other. Nice. There's also what they say a bunch of bunch of thermistors here. Is that what these are? I think so. I believe that's what they are. These are thermistors. Uh, they're not, like I say, they're not labelled. I, I don't really know how to measure them to know what they are. Again, with no bill of materials, I've kind of got no information on what they could be. But I believe these to be there. It looks like that's what they are in the picture. So that's what I'm going to go for. <laughs> that might sound a bit kind of ad hoc. But these things do generally work themselves out. They are more obvious than you'd think. Mostly. Uh, wobble those down. Now the height on these doesn't really matter quite so much. Because all of them are quite snug. Because of the bent legs action. Well, should these stick out on their shoulders? See these shoulders here? Should they stick out on those? Is that important? Because I'm pushing them all the way down to the bottom. So there's a question. Should they, should they stick out like this one? Or should they be flush? Let me know. You can measure them with a multimeter. Okay. What resistance? Because they're very because they are thermistors. They're eleven K and rising. Eleven point three K. Has a measurement of this done me any good at all? If I put my finger on it, does it drop? Yeah, it does. Look at that. So, yeah, I can sort of measure it. <laughs> so, okay, so while... Somebody's waiting to tell me whether they should be sticking out or not. Put that one in there. I will do the resistors. So the two stand-up resistors is the 33K, which I think was this bottom one here. Let me measure that. Thirty-three, yeah. So, with a stand-up resistor, all you're doing is sort of bending it like that. So it stand, stands up like that. It stands up. Okay, yeah, got it. It's Thirty-three is this one. That's a test point. I guess it's that circle. That it sits on. Yeah, 
Okay, it sits on the circle on the screen print and goes to the leg above it like that. Righty O, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. And the other one is a 14K, which I think is this one. Yep. It's the same deal. Uh, Ian says, I play safe and not push the messes all the way to the board in case they snap apart. Oh, okay. This one goes in there. 14k. I could have them just wobbled up a little bit. Just so they're onto those rocky bits. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Making a mountain out of a molehill, really. Okay, that's good. I like the look of that. So that's a whole bunch more soldering to do. Lovely. Uh, thanks, Morat. I really appreciate your uh, your coming along and giving us a bit of advice. That's super. Have a good one. I think I'm going to be here some time, and nobody's obliged to stay. <laughs> but I am going to push on through and see if I can get this as done as yeah as done. I mean, there's no there's either done or not done, isn't there? So the plan is definitely to get it done. Now these transistor legs are a little tricky. They're quite close together. And I appreciate it's even later in Europe, of course. Okay, they look all right. On this side, anyway. Ooh, it's not particularly tidy down here. I can 
and take those ends off a little bit nearer. That's all right. That's okay. Orientation is important. Yeah, vertically placed resistors. Yeah, good, did that. Right. Next, insert the and solder, the film, and electrolytic capacitors. So, electrolytic capacitors are these ones that look like capacitors. And they have an orientation. They have a long leg. Um, I'm inclined to say long leg positive. Long leg positive. Which is a little song I tend to sing whenever I'm doing this sort of thing. There's a minor stripe on the side of the capacitor's body to indicate the shorter leg, which is a negative leg. On these PCBs, the positive pad for the capacitor has a square shape. So we're looking at these round ones here, these round ones. And the square pad apparently is positive. Um, don't take that as a rule though, because I've seen PCBs that have um, square ones completely randomly, not necessarily positive, not necessarily negative, <laughs> and completely inconsistent across an entire board. But apparently that's what it is on this board, so that's what we can go with. It's not labelled otherwise. I mean, you do have this line on the circle, which tends to indicate negative, which follows if the square one is positive yeah so we've got are these two the same yeah so it doesn't really matter what they are 47 microfarad both the same and no other additional one no okay cool so these go in long leg positive long leg positive into the square like so long leg positive into the square they are going in opposite directions they always look like proper components <laughs> and what about the square ones yeah well, maybe, I know, because I can bend the legs, can't I? So it won't matter. So let's do those two. So this is the 2.2. This one goes down the bottom here. Now these ones aren't, uh, these film capacitors are not polarised, so they can be any way round. 2.2 is a square box it's got here. It's got an optional one next to it. That's interesting. And that goes there. The other one, the stubby one, this fella. This goes further up here. One microfarad, which is that one. Out, a little bit spikier in order to push the pins. And then we can solder those. Oh, this is coming along a good one now. Sometimes it just don't want to flow. Hey, let's get rid of this one. Go on. Yep. This little one here. Good, now your PCB should look like this. Let's hope, eh? Should 
look like this. Oh, that's a bit wobbly. <laughs> oh well, never mind. Good, good. I think it looks like the picture. Can't see anything obvious that's missing. It's always a good sign. Those are in. Those are the right way round. Those are all in. Two more knots. Da -de -da -de -da. Great. Okay, next page. We're on 47 to 52. We are not far away. So next, solder the precision trimmer and the power supply socket. This is the little trimmer, this blue thing. No, no, positive. Right, um, oh, I'm upside down. No, I'm not the right way around. This goes down here somewhere. So I've got three, I've got three legs. And on the silk screen, it's got a picture of where the screw should be, this thing here. So that's nice and easy. That just pops in there. Lovely. And the other thing, power connector. This fella. So you connect it to the Eurorack bus board with. And on here, uh, often you'll see it with a with a nick out of the side that that sort of corresponds to the one here this does this is not having one it does have this little corner shaved off so uh <laughs> i'm going to make the assumption that it should be this way round now it says down here minus 12 volts which will lead me to believe so i could kind of confirm this that the minus 12 should be the red stripe on my ribbon cable with no red stripe. Do you see that? Oh, it's a very faint red stripe here. But this will plug in like that. And if the red stripe goes to minus 12, which is on there, then this has to go this way around because this has a key on it here and can only fit in one way around. So it has to fit in that way around. Therefore, by that process, it must go in this way around in order for that to function correctly. The arrow pointing at the first pin. Is there an arrow? Oh, I don't see an arrow. Yep, no, well, whatever. But we worked it out, so that's good. So then we need to solder those in. I don't think those are too hard for me to bend. So I might just have to sort of do a bit of a, put it down gently like that kind of thing. And now this is sticking up. Where is this sticking up? What's sticking up? Okay, so I've got a little bit of a problem in that the capacitors are taller. See that? The capacitors are taller than the power socket. So I can't put this down flat. So I'm going to use a bit of foam that the IC holders came on. Stick that down on there. That's not really helping. Well, it's helping a little bit. But at least I can get it flat. Can I put this something else underneath in order to hold it a little bit? Right, so I'm just going to have to sort of wing it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of hold it down so it feels flat. I'm having to use three pairs of hands here. So I'm going to hold that there. Stick some solder on. Continue to hold it. Let it come off. Now I'm sure in the chat you can tell me of all the tools with which I should use in order to do that. But that seems to work. I'm happy with that. Thanks very much. Do the other side. Let that uh, cool. Oop.
back over here for this trimmer. Oh, they went all on to, <laughs> they went all on the soldier nine. Not a single little bit on the board. Just perfect. Good. Don't need to cut off the those. Those are short enough as it is. I'll just take off these three. Now I think about the trimmer being here, as it might be difficult to get to. Uh, no, but it's going to be that way up, isn't it? So yeah, no, I'm talking rubbish. Talking rubbish. All right, good. That's all in. Lovely. Next one. Now turn the PCB around to inspect your solder joints. Right, right, yeah. Oh, well, they look fabulous, these solder joints. It's like a work of art. I think. So make sure all components are soldered properly. <laughs> there are no cold solder joints or accidental shorts. Clean the PCB to remove extra flux if necessary. That looks all right to me. I have no means by which to clean anything, so I'm, I'm not going to be doing that. But at the moment, that looks fine. Is that? F I think that's flux. Oh, let's just have a look at something here. Yeah, that's just flux. All right, I'll be eating my words then, won't I? So good, 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 good. Page 48, insert the jack sockets and solder them. Oh, all right, okay, cool, nice, right, just do that. So we're now on this side of the board, this way up. We're gonna take our jack sockets, stick all those in. They go into these bits here. You've got that one sticky out leg that goes in to the sticky out bit. You see the two holes here, the most the most furthest out. So you put that in first and sort of push up against it, and that gives it a little bit of grip. It goes in there. It's got a nasty scrape on there. How did I manage to do that? Pure carelessness, I suppose. Uh, and there's one more. like that now it says to solder them now that's a slight worry the reason that's a worry is that um, they're liable to not necessarily be straight when I solder them so I tend to like to use the front panel as a guide so I kind of put the front panel on so that I know that when I solder them they're going to be able to fit that makes sense so I'm just gonna hold off for a second and if the pots go in next I think I might do the whole lot see and it's saying to do that with the pots I'd like to do that with the sockets as well so this bit here where it says insert the jack sockets and solder them I'm not going to solder them so I'm going to go and insert the, the pots as well. Then do that whole lot together with the front panel on so that it's all nicely aligned. That's my plan. I've learnt from bitter experience. So don't mix up the values and don't solder them yet. Put the front panel on. Yep, yep, yep. Then go ahead and solder them. So the big fat, ouch, B100 is the, the pitch one. This is a one by itself so this one we know this one that's going to go up here hopefully it's not all completely bent out of shape no it is all completely bent out of shape there we go it's in nicely now these other three four they are different So, I 
So there's two of the same, which are B100s. B0404, so those B104s, if you can see that, these two are the same. So these are the 100 K ones for fine tuning and pulse width. So those two are easy. The other two, I've got a, a B254 and a B205, for which we have no information. So, oh, does it say on the board? No, it just gives the amount. It doesn't tell you the part number. So I'll have to look it up. Look it up. So this, what do I have? B254, B two five four potentiometer b254 is the 250 250 is on this side is the cv in on the pulse width which is there so this by default must be the other one Cool. They are all in. We are really nearly there. Fantastic. So what I'll do, I will stick this on and just put on a nut or two to hold it on. Like that. Just, you know, not just finger tight. So that I know when I sold all these in, those are going to be right. Now, this could be tricky. I haven't put my chips in. That's okay. <laughs> Just suddenly thought, I haven't put my chips in. That's all right. We haven't done that bit yet. And I can still access it because it's that way up. Right. So this is tricky because um, I'm now soldering on the same side of the board as a lot of components so I have to be very careful not to melt stuff yeah so I'm soldering all around here and I could poss potentially melt into these bits and pieces and I have to be careful I couldn't see any value on the pots to be fair I have looked and looked because we had this problem when building it on the breadboard so you know I had to each time google them Maybe I'm not looking hard enough. I don't know, but there was no, there was nothing. So I've got all these here. Let's just get on with this. Oh, that was really rubbish. That's better. Solder is fascinating stuff. I mean, I've never done any surface mount with a heat gun. I've just done manual surface mount. But watching videos of people doing that is quite extraordinary the way it pulls things together and behaves the way it runs it's an extraordinary material Oh, come on, heat. That's all that. And this is also where it's very easy to miss something because I don't want to melt that because it's crowded and we can't quite see. That's obviously 
as when you've got great big legs sticking out. Are we there yet? No, not quite. Right, I think that's it. I think that's it. It looks like a bleeding module, don't it? It smells like I've melted something. <laughs> See, those are all wonky, and had I not had the front panel on, it would have been different. I don't think I melted anything. A little bit, perhaps, on the edge of that IC holder. Otherwise, it's looking good. Look, single PCB, both sides. Nice, simple, good stuff. Like it. Right. Install the front panel, okay, fix it into place with the five hex nuts on the jack sockets and a washer on the top potentiometer. Yeah, fit the large knob on the bare prometer shaft, fix it with a small grooves driver, we're almost done. Good lord, so all right, I didn't really need to take that off then, okay, fair enough. So, uh, let me can see, the, the height of this pot is higher than these ones. A little bit but because we've got these which are also the same height as this pot it's going to rest on this and this 
and not actually be attached to these at all. These don't have a screw thread for holding them in. Those are just mounted to the board and it's that which gives them uh, their strength as opposed to being attached to the front panel per se. Right, got it, good, yeah. That just goes on there somehow. Right, so let's nut it then. <laughs> you know it's quarter past ten, don't you, Jeremy? Oh, time's getting on. Oh, I see. Gee whiz, come on. Sometimes screw threads just are not with you. Now if this was a Bifaco kit, it would have those lovely Bifaco banana nut things. I've got a tool for this, particularly. Just gonna finger tight it down. Good. Wash it down on there. Good, feeling nice and solid. There's a knob. So I turn the knob all the way to the left. It's got a little screw in the side. I need a little screwdriver. And do it. So if I put this all the way around to the, the left, then I know that that'll be on the on that bit. Do you see what I mean? Yeah? And then you can hold that on there, do up the nut. Oh, is that as far as it goes? Yeah, so I think that's as far as it goes. All the way around. I could probably, I think I overshot just a tiny bit. So I'm going to undo it a tiny bit. Put a little bit there. I mean, fit to taste, really, I think is the idea. That'll do. That'll do for me. That'll do for me. There you go. Anything missing? Are oh, the chips, I think. Cool. So, we are almost done, it says. Insert the ICs into the respective dip sockets. Right. Um. <laughs> Hang on. Which one is which? Match the notch, yeah. Okay, it says so, TL074, and then the other one. So on here, this is the TL074. Very careful taking this out of here. Well, it comes easy, easy. 74, got to look for the that bit on it, which is going to be facing this way, pretty sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, because it's been on the breadboard, it should just fit in there beautifully. Yes, little rock, and it's in. This one is going to be a little bit harder for some reason. What I don't want is it to bend legs as I take it out. Done. 
course, don't touch the legs with your hands. So this way round also faces down. These just need a little bit of a bend in, I think. Way around. These are a little bit close to each other. Okay, that's in. Button up. That's in. Looks the same as that. Lovely, 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 lovely. Right. Congratulations! You've completed the assembly of your ES space X space MKI dot EDU space VCO module. Now connect it to your Eurac power supply and switch it on. Oh, I don't want to. There's no magic smoke. It's a good sign that your build was successful. Connect the VCO saw output to a mixer and check you get a signal. Rotate the course knob and <laughs> make sure it's like the, what's that title doing there? That shouldn't, shouldn't have a title there. And and make sure you hear a change in pitch. If you do, proceed to the tuning of the VCO as we've done before. Oh my god. Right, so uh, uh, yeah, Moritz, there's a there's a sentence on page that goes from page forty nine to fifty that just needs to be pulled back. You can give yourself an extra, you know, uh, step that back one, and you should get that all back on that page. <laughs> Otherwise, we're talking about soldering. So you're right, we're there. We should be there. We should be able to test it. Let me get on with that. So I'm gonna turn off my soldering iron for the minute. So I'm just gonna absolutely assume we're not gonna have to reflow anything. <laughs> Make myself some room. Pull this back. Oh, other way out again. Now I've got me super reliable. Uh, this one, which has my O2 scope in it, so that seems like a good idea. Let's use that. Uh, power. Let me turn that off. Right. Uh, I'm sorry if the if my mic's a little low. I'm a bit further away from the mic now. You're just going to have to deal with it. So, ribbon cable. I had one of those. Here we go. So, the ribbon cable is going to go into there, like so. It can only go in one way round. We soldered it the right way to start with. Then power this end goes the right way round into your internal power supply in the URAC case. If you don't have a URAC case, I can't really help you. There is a URAC case coming with this kit, but it's not going to be one of the first things. We're going to make a couple of modules first, and then the case of power supply comes along, I believe. Now that means it's possible, if you don't have a case, that you'll be unable to test it properly. That's all right. Just put it to one side and we'll come back to it later. But you've already tested it on the breadboard, so you know, roughly speaking, that it works. And I don't think, you know, it's one of those things where they could have released the case first, but then it wouldn't do anything. <laughs> so I think doing the VCO first makes a lot of sense because it makes some noise. You can plug it into something, just into a pair of headphones, and you'll get something out. That's got to be the way forward. And the case will come in a month or two. And that will be great. I do have it. Um, it's very simple, which is great, but it's you know cost effective, that kind of thing, which is what we're looking for. So I just want to get this into shot a little bit better. Like so. We'll turn it on, see if there's any smoke. Any last words?
No multimeter testing. No, no multimeter testing. What are you talking about? <laughs> okay, here we go. Boom, if I disappear, you'll know something terrible has happened. Bum, 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 bum. It doesn't appear to be any smoke. It's not making any noise either. <laughs> right, so uh, what, I'll, what I'll do is I will take take it into the scope. So that's my output going into the computer. The computer. And I will take sawtooth output, plug it into here. I'd be really disappointed to see absolutely nothing happen at all. Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. Nothing. Darn it. Okay, think about it. Let's try the pulse outfit. That nothing there either oh rats oh, I don't really do these things optimistically okay I'm going to bypass the, this just in case that's the thing turn this up that's going into there uh, hang on a second. So yeah, so why is it not getting anything, any any love into the? Uh... Oh, there it is. I don't know. Maybe I just needed to bang it or something. <laughs> I, don't know. I cannot explain that. Because that doesn't do anything at that point. So what I could do, right, is, is laughably take an output from Bloom. That's a rubbish long enough cable. And um, plug that in, except I have no idea how to use Bloom. It's one of the completely mysterious things I've got. Okay, that's good. So, awesome. I had an LFO coming in here, didn't I? It still works. FM input. Yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, I think everything works. What I haven't done is tune it. So, what I'll need to do not too loud. A little bit. I'll get my key step.
what is it with the key step and the <laughs> this octave range? So it's a little bit wide. Can't probably see that. Can you see that? So what I'll do, uh, I've got the tuner set up, so I don't like the old O2, O2 tuner, I've got the tuner here. What I can do, so yes, the, the C2 now, it's so much better, look at that, that's really good. So it's going from C2 to B2. Talking about right, so I need to undo it, put my hands inside. Fine needs to go to midway, does it? Why is that? If I put the fine to midway, then it's gonna miss. And I'll have to use the course to try to bring it back to C2, which is more difficult than the fine, but you know. I'll endeavour to do what you want me to, man. That's close enough for me. So what we need to do is get our little screwdriver, which I had a minute ago. It's always the third one. Correct? Find our little thing here. And put that up. Let's see if I can get to widen it out a little bit. now I've got <laughs> so it's this idea you chase these things around so I've now used up all my fine Not doing this right, don't think. <laughs> That's getting worse. I'm trying to pull it apart. That's no one here. I hate tuning oscillators. See, that's as far as it's going to go. It's not going to go any further than that. So I'm not doing this right.
Oh, bloody hell. Mine should be left in the centre until the tuning's done. Tune middle C to perfection, but that's my strat. Yeah, set an octave. Okay, alright, that's an idea. Right, so. Um, I can do that. There we go, that's something approaching it.
so there you go there you have it the eric since educational <laughs> educational uh moritz klein diy edu vco kit nice nice Yeah, so so there you go. There, there it is. There it is working. It had me going there for a minute when I <laughs> didn't seem to be doing anything. I don't know why that was. I'm not going to worry about it too hard. Uh, but it all just seemed to come to life at some point, uh, which is awesome. It it acts like an oscillator. I've got uh, two waveform outputs. I've got, I've got FM and I've got pulse width modulation. What more could you want? What I need now is a filter. I think one of those is going to be a long... At some point soon so <laughs> so there you go what do you think about that then we did get there i mean it's now so that was two and a half hours tonight um yeah so in total i mean this this is probably taking me an entire day i would say i mean we had those two hours on friday night then i had you know two three hours on monday a couple of hours this morning and now a couple of hours tonight um but that's okay i mean this is this is supposed to be a learning experience and that's absolutely what it has been working through the documentation documentation is excellent i mean in some ways i'm i'm dead chuffed that i found a little problem in it and i know that moritz has been working on version two of the manual based upon uh, some of the things that i've said and, and what we encountered last week and uh, I think that's great because it's overall going to Im to improve everything because I think what they've come to understand or what he's come to understand is the level that you need to go to <laughs> to pull more people on board, people like myself. In order for, for us idiots to have a better idea of getting through this, it just needs that little bit more expansion. It just needs a little bit more stuff. A little bit more assurance, a little bit more hand-holding. Not a lot. I mean, I was able to work my way through it, uh, but I I can imagine that some people would find uh, some of the things very frustrating. Um, and the, the difficulty is that you end up feeling that you don't know what you're doing. And as soon as you don't know what you're doing, you start to think, I just know if I can't be asked with this, you know. Um, so the the you know the the balance i suppose between making you have to learn and uh giving you the answer so you don't go nuts just that needs a little bit of tweaking a little bit of tweaking but otherwise the explanations of everything were brilliant and there's a load of stuff in that manual that i didn't actually go to that that expands on what op, op amps are it expands on all the different components so there's more information available within that document that i didn't even touch on you know, and that, uh, and obviously, if I was doing this by myself in my own time, uh, I could spend more time in those sorts of areas. But undoubtedly, I've learned a huge amount in doing this, <laughs> which is exactly the whole point. The whole point is to teach you stuff, and that's what it does, because it makes you work for it. Yeah, I love that it's working. God, I don't know what I was going to do. <laughs> it couldn't come up. Oh, goodness. Goodness. Do I feel I have a better understanding of how a VCO works? I do. I do. I don't think um, I'm going to retain it exactly. But when I meet these circuits again, um, I'll, I'll know what to look out for, I think. Yeah, I don't, I don't think... I, I think it would be overly ambitious to to say that, aha, now I know how a VCO works. I can build my own or I can modify this in some way. No, not exactly. I mean, what I can do, I think, is I can go back to the schematic and look at the back of this and start to identify different bits of it. I think that's possible because I know which resistors and which components I use together to do the different parts of the circuit I would then be able to look at that so theoretically if something was wrong like pulse width wasn't working for instance 
I could probably identify the components that were contributing to that and focus on that for the troubleshooting. So that's interesting. I wouldn't be able to do that before. I mean, before when I'm troubleshooting, you just look at the back and go, oh my God, I have no clue. And then you start reflowing solder and you start on every leg that looks a bit ropey and try that out and so on and so forth. It's really, without any circuit knowledge, you can't really identify the areas that you need to look at in response to the problem that you've encountered. Whereas now I think I could have a fair crack at that. And that's interesting. It's also become less less mysterious, less, um, I'm less afraid of it, as in I could pull out a resistor and change its value and just to see what it does without the fear of, of somehow breaking it. <laughs> because it's very robust. I mean, when you're playing with that on a breadboard, you've got things clattering into each other and shorting each other out all the time, you know? So, in that respect, I know that it's more, it's easier to fiddle with than I thought. I mean, I had kind of had this realization when uh, I started building that Cosmo module back with uh, Sam Lookman No Computer, a couple of years ago now that was, and the way that he treated components and the way that he swapped things out and said, well, it doesn't matter, just use that one, or, or you know, use that one, or change this value. That was a, a real mind opener from the position of assuming that everything has to be absolutely what it's supposed to be. And actually, that's not the case at all. You can vary it depending on what it is that you want, want to happen. So, so yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Great stuff. Really looking forward to the next one uh, already. Um, don't know how soon that will be. Soon, I think, because this came out two weeks ago was it um at the beginning of the month right at the turn of the month so we should have another one in a week or two and and i will do the same thing again we'll aim for doing it in one session in a couple of hours but it may bleed into two and i won't know until we do it that's the thing but we will aim for one and see how we go because it may simply be that this particular one was more complicated and also me getting used to using a breadboard there was lots of little hurdles for me to get over so um, a different circuit might uh, might be simpler easier to get through we shall see we shall see <laughs> cool well i've got no reason to hang on here now so what's happening next so um with that done that's great so tomorrow night, I have this live performance in Norwich. <laughs> That's funny because I, my, my rig is over there and it's only half built because I had to take half of the stuff out to do the Stochastic Instruments uh, live stream I did last week, which is all in that box up there. Now I could potentially just take the orange box to the gig and set Stochastic inspiration generator going and step aside and let it play for 20 minutes but that just doesn't seem very exciting to me it's a lovely thing but not really for uh, an electronic music open mic night where you're trying to sort of grab attention and be interesting so i don't think that's the right answer so i'm gonna go back to my you know the, the plan with the the two uh, arturia rack brutes that plan uh, I've got yeah I've got half a system together, so I know that I can get started. Um, what I had hoped to have, in fact, was a uh, I was getting a mixer from Feedback, that six-channel Boss-style mixer, which was going to be awesome. It is awesome. It will be awesome, but it's currently stuck in Bucharest, so sadly that's not going to be here. So I'm going to have to think. I'm probably not going to mix. I'm probably just going to mute stuff in and out because that's simpler. Um, but I'm also taking the black sequencer out because that uses up too much HP for what I use it for. I'm going to have to work out how am I going to sequence things. Exactly. <laughs> and what sound sources I'm going to use. Um, so there's lots for me to do tomorrow before the gig in the evening. And I haven't even come up with a patch yet. So that's going to be interesting. So that's my plan for tomorrow is just get stuck into that, see how I go. I'm sure I can come up with a, a patch that I can work for, you know, 10, 15 minutes that will be 
um, interesting enough to take along. Uh, the plan is that I will be live streaming it. Uh, it will only be through my phone, so it will be what it will be. I'm going to be using this, which is uh, the iRig Stream Pro. Uh, I've just got it out of the box. Uh, IK Model Media sent these to me. I've got a Pro and I've also got a Solo because I did that video on the iRig Stream, which was a very, excuse me, the, probably the most successful video I've ever done <laughs> ever in terms of views. And so when they brought these out, I suggested that I could probably do a video on them, which I plan to do so. But this is a lot chunkier um, than the iRig Stream. It'll be interesting to try that out. Exactly how I go into this and then out to the PA, I don't know. I might, I might split the output. Maybe it's a better idea to take two outputs. Can I do that? I think I can. I can and then just record to this rather than through it that might not be a bad idea I might do that but I've never used this before so that's another challenge getting that to work it takes batteries though which is a very cool thing batteries in the back because the other one did have power problems that's not as pro feeling as one would like it to be but never mind it's got a button so yeah doing that through my phone see what happens um i'm scheduled to be on at about nine o'clock but i have a hell of a day tomorrow <laughs> with running kids to some very very important things before i can get on the way to the gig so it's gonna be a funny day tomorrow uh, did i find out what went wrong with the sound what on the uh, what we got funny sound through the phone when I was doing the uh, the live streaming of this build earlier in the week I think it was just running for too long I think it was simply that and also I think it was because um, I ended a stream and then came back and just started the stream again I think I probably needed to quit um, uh, restream and then restart it things like that I think it was purely down to the length of time it had been running or s something in other words no I've got no idea <laughs> I'm just gonna go with it gonna go with it so testing this out tomorrow building a rig putting a patch together taking my kids to things they need to go to having some tea going to Norwich doing a quick gig easy no problem so that's coming up tomorrow uh, I'll post a link to the to the YouTube thing. I won't. I might not be together enough to actually stream into that link. I'll try to make that work. Um, it may just start streaming randomly from whenever it is I hit go. I don't. I don't quite know. We'll, we'll work that out tomorrow. Other than that, uh, the Molten Music Monthly is out, so do go and check that out. Uh, that's available now in the channel. And then Sunday night, this Sunday night, 8 o'clock, we're going to kick back. I'm going to have some beer this time and we'll talk. We'll talk about this. We'll talk about all the live streams I've done over the last couple of weeks. Talk about Molten Monthly. Uh, talk about the gig. And, and all of that. That'll be good. I'm looking forward to Sunday of kicking back and just talking more. I just seem to like talking. So let's do that. So thanks ever so much for being with me this evening. I hope that's helpful. Looking forward to the next one the next module which is great super <laughs> yeah and I'll be exhausted that'll be great cool so as I say thanks for stopping by in the meantime uh, go make some tunes I'll, I'll find my exit music
here's a question, right, for anyone who's still left. This is something that that I find a bit weird sometimes, and I think it's something with, with Erica Synth modules that happens. Why is it that when I don't put anything into the one volt blocky, the tuning sort of it goes from at the moment it's going from something zero up to uh, sort of like a zero to a one. So I get like two octaves of play, right? But then when I plug something in. I then get a much wider range. I don't know why that is. I guess the voltage coming in is adding to the voltage or something. I don't know, anyway, it's just something that's always bubbled me a little bit. I'm not going to worry about it. Anyway, bye bye. Sorry about that.